The subject of today's session is an idea that sounds very familiar to us because it is very well anchored in the norms of many jobs in Western society today. It's the subject of the opening verses in Leviticus chapter 25 the sabbatical year. So of course, again, the idea of a sabbatical year is something with which we're very familiar in contemporary society. Inevitably, as always, an important question for us to bear in mind is whether the idea of the sabbatical year that we know in contemporary society is the same idea of the sabbatical year of which God speaks in Leviticus chapter 25. There are a few ideas that at first brush will sound awfully familiar in Leviticus chapter 25, but inevitably we always need to probe more deeply. So without any further ado, let's launch into chapter 25 and see what God is teaching us. At the beginning of the chapter, God spoke unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, verse 2, speak unto the people of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land that I give you, then shall the land rest for a Sabbath unto God. Now, in this opening verse, in verse 2, we already encounter two principal themes that, as we'll see, are very recurrent in this chapter. One, when you come into the land. The land. Indeed, the land is what rests for this Sabbath unto God. Besides the land, the other recurrent thing, Sabbath. And indeed, the Sabbath is the self same word that we have in Hebrew for Sabbath, the, the seventh day of the week. But here, it's not a seventh day of the week. It is rather, as we go on to read in verse three, six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in the produce thereof. But in the seventh year, not day, year, shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land. A Sabbath unto God. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. So, of course, we're very familiar with the idea of a Sabbath as a day for people. What is this Sabbath as a year for the land? The initial answer we just read, you shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. Indeed, we read again in verse 5 that you don't harvest either the grain that grows of itself or the grapes. It is a year of solemn rest for the land. Now, of course, at this point already, it should be clear to us that one of the ideas of which God is speaking here is an idea with which we are very familiar and I think are especially sensitive nowadays, environmental awareness, environmental responsibility. The land needs to rest, it really does. We know that when the land is cultivated year after year after year, the soil becomes depleted. So letting the fields lie fallow is very important in order for the land to rejuvenate. Unquestionably, there is that theme here of environmental responsibility, but then, of course, still we're going to need to ask ourselves, is that all that God is invoking here? Well, certainly not because we're not finished. We continue 
in verse six, and we encounter another principle with which we're very familiar nowadays. And the Sabbath produce of the land shall be for food for you, not just for you, for you and for your servant and for your maidservant and for your hired servant and for the sojourner by your side who sojourns with you. Not just environmental responsibility, also social responsibility. Being aware of all of those others who maybe don't have such a stable livelihood, who don't have land that is sustaining them, you need to be concerned for those who are less fortunate than you. So in addition to the environmental awareness and responsibility, there's also social awareness and social responsibility. And indeed, these two principles, in a sense, come together in verse 7, an astounding statement that besides the produce of the land being for you and everyone else, it's not even just for human beings and for your cattle and for the beasts that are in your land shall all the produce thereof be for food. So that social responsibility to care for others indeed jives with the environmental responsibility because you're concerned not even only for human beings, you're concerned for the whole world, even the beasts that are in your land. Everyone is sustained by this produce of the sabbatical year. Okay, so at this point, again, we've encountered environmental responsibility and social responsibility. Of course, we still need to ask ourselves, is that really it? Is that what's going on here? Would those principles, however important they are, justify this extraordinary expression that the land rests for Sabbath unto God? Let's keep those questions in mind and in the meantime, continue in Leviticus chapter 25. Because beginning in verse 8, we encounter an additional principle. A whole set of rules that pertain to an additional year besides the sabbatical year. And you shall number seven Sabbaths of years unto you, seven times seven years, and there shall be unto you the days of seven Sabbaths of years. Well, of course, seven times seven, even 49 years. Then shall you make proclamation with the blast of the horn on the 10th day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement, shall you make proclamation with the horn throughout all your land. So, of course, as we noted elsewhere, it is the seventh month, but it is a kind of new year of sorts as well. And so on the 10th day of the month, this new year is declared as a jubilee year as part of the proceedings that pertain to the day of atonement to yom kippur and what are the implications of that proclamation verse 10 you shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof it shall be a jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man unto his possession, and you shall return every man unto his family. We continue in verse 11, a jubilee shall that 50th year be unto you. Now, that also implies that just as you observe the sabbatical year by not sowing nor reaping, so too with respect to the jubilee year. You shall not sow, neither reap, that which grows of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of the undressed vines. Verse 12, for it is a jubilee, it shall be holy unto you. You shall eat the produce thereof out of the field, just as you do with the sabbatical year. So the laws that pertain to the sabbatical year, of which we read earlier in chapter 25, 
pertain to this 50th year, the Jubilee year as well. But there's this additional dimension. Again, we already saw it expressed in verse 10. You shall return every man unto his possession and you shall return every man unto his family. And this is reiterated in verse 13. In this year of Jubilee, you shall return every man unto his possession. And in the verses that follow, we're bridging because of the limits of time. We realize that what this means is not merely social responsibility, but actually redistribution of wealth. Because whatever fields had been sold over the course of the intervening 49 years in the Jubilee year returned to their original owner. Meaning that when someone buys a field in the land, this land, over the course of the intervening 49 years, he's really not buying the land. He's buying rights to cultivate the land. Of course, the rights to eat the fruit of his labors in cultivating the land, but the land doesn't really become his because at the end of those 49 years, in the Jubilee year, the land reverts to the previous owner. So at this point, of course, in addition to environmental responsibility and social responsibility, we could also add redistribution of wealth. That is starting afresh every 50 years, which is really an amazing idea when one considers the social implications. But again, of course, I'm still going to ask, what does all this mean? These values sound very humanistic. So is Leviticus chapter 25 a lesson in humanism? And in some plane, I think we already appreciate inevitably what the answer to this question must be. If it is a Sabbath to God, all of these values and ideals of course, completely laudable, but completely insufficient. Because at the end of the day, we need, of course, to ask ourselves, these values, they appeal to what for their basis? Because inevitably, all these lofty ideals, when not grounded in an appeal to absolute value become a very fickle matter of individual interpretation, individual willingness, individual gauging of what is or is not valuable. But all this, from our perspective, is a value because it appeals to the one, the only source of value. It's all based upon God. And of course, it's always important for us to bear in mind here. When we speak of everything being an appeal to God, of course, we're not speaking of some flesh and blood tyrant. God is the source of absolute truth absolute goodness, absolute justice, absolute righteousness. It is through that connection with God that all of these humanistic values really become valuable. Humanism by itself remains woefully inadequate. And indeed, when we consider what takes place in the continuation of the chapter, this idea, I think, becomes eminently clear. Because we read in verse 18, in particular, in the context of these laws that pertain to the sabbatical year and the jubilee year, you shall do my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them, and you shall dwell in the land in safety. That is, you're not doing these because they make sense to you, because they appeal to your environmental and social sensitivities. 
you're doing them because they indeed derive from the ultimate, absolute source of meaning. My statutes, my ordinances. And when you do that, recalling that recurrent theme in this whole chapter, the land, then the land will yield her fruit and you shall eat until you have enough and dwell therein in safety. Because this consciousness is, if you will, an entry requirement in order to come into land, in order to remain in the land. And uh, when one considers the implications that this all really derives not from all of your various humanistic sensitivities, but from God, you can well appreciate what God tells us from verse 20 and on. An extraordinary passage. And I must admit, one of the extraordinary aspects of this passage, beginning in verse 20, is, you know, of course, we don't need convincing that the Bible is the word of God. But when we consider these verses, this is one of the passages that makes it particularly difficult to posit that it could have been written by anyone other than by the one, the only one, who is truly in charge. And if you shall say, what shall we eat the seventh year? Behold, we may not sow, nor gather in our produce. Then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth produce for the three years. And you shall sow the eighth year and eat of the produce, the old store, until the ninth year. Until our produce come in, you shall eat the old store. That is, since in the seventh year you are neither harvesting what is ready to be harvested, nor sowing what will be ready the following year, there's a problem of two years that are missing from your agricultural produce cycle. And God says, don't worry. In the sixth year, I'll give you a triple harvest. Now let's just consider what this is telling us. Can we imagine if a human being were to attempt to fraudulently pass off this book as divine, if in fact he wrote it himself? Can we imagine a promise like this? Don't worry, I'll give you a triple harvest. I'll bless the produce of the sixth year. Obviously, even if he were to temporarily succeed in convincing people that this book has a divine origin, if it was really a fraud, well, the moment the people whom he has convinced get ready for that first sabbatical year, and there isn't a triple harvest in the sixth year, they'll know it was a fraud. No human author could possibly have had the audacity to make a promise like this. But of course, there was no human author. And this passage drives home to us with utmost force the realization these promises could only come from God himself. These rules, likewise, come only from God himself. And when we consider all of the important humanistic messages that we can derive from these rules, it's always important for us to bear this in mind. They may be humanistic values, but we are not embracing humanism. These rules come from God. And that makes all the difference. As God stresses the point in verse 23, and the land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. Now again, 
it's always important for us to bear in mind the obvious. God is not some flesh and blood tyrant. He's not saying, mine, mine, mine. He's saying, just bear in mind. It's not yours, yours, yours. Appreciate that the source of meaning, the source of value is not your own possessiveness, your own acquisitiveness. It's not a matter of what I have, because ultimately, everything that I have, all the property, all the possessions, all of the matter, doesn't really matter by itself. Everything physical is only means to the spiritual. The physical possessions can never be self-justifying because in fact, the physical universe can never be self-justifying. It is only justified through an appeal to the ultimate non-physical source in God. And I think it is likewise in that vein that we can well appreciate verse 24. And in all the land of your possession, you shall grant a redemption for the land. What's the meaning of this redemption for the land? Well, of course, on the most accessible plane, the redemption is what happens in the Jubilee year, because the land may have become encumbered, subordinated to various other owners in the interim, but there's a redemption for the land because the land reverts to its original owner. That's on one level. But inevitably, I think we appreciate this also the deeper level. That over the course of all those intervening years, the land may be subordinated to a whole lot of other things. Ulterior motives, agendas, various attitudes that sought to justify themselves in their own terms. The redemption for the land is flush all of that away, leave it all behind. Ultimately, it's all reverting to God. It is all justified through that reversion to God through the realization that, again, as God expresses it in verse 23, the land is mine. It's all connected to God. And it is redeemed through that connection to God. Now, it's important for us to consider these two recurrent themes, as we've already noted, the Sabbath and the Sabbath of the land. The land, if anything, is the recurrent dominant theme relentlessly in all of this. So, of course, we already noted the obvious question. We know what it means to have a Sabbath as a seventh day of the week. What's the purpose of this additional Sabbath? And on some plane, I think inevitably, the answer, considering that we're using the exact same word, Sabbath must be. The themes are indeed similar. What's the Sabbath about as the seventh day of the week? We've mentioned in the past, and I know many of you have experienced this together with us as our guests at our Sabbath dinner table, that when in obedience, of God's command to remember, to mention the Sabbath day, to make it holy. In the Decalogue in Exodus chapter 20, we stand for the Kiddush, the sanctification, to declare the Sabbath day holy. At the beginning of our Sabbath dinner, Friday evening, The way Kiddush begins is by reciting Genesis chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3, recounting how God completed all the work of the heavens and the earth, and how he blessed the seventh day and made it holy. 
And we stand when we recite those verses because as we've discussed in the past, in the court of law as ordained in the Torah, the witnesses bear testimony standing. And we are all witnesses bearing testimony as we recite Genesis chapter two, verses one, two, and three, that God created the heavens and the earth. That ultimately, it's not about the rat race of what we're trying to accomplish all the other days of the week. It's all about returning to God. And thus, the Sabbath shines its light upon the other six days of the week as well. It becomes the culmination of the days that came before. It becomes the seed, the germination point for the days that follow, because the message of the Sabbath is everything ultimately is devoted to God. Again, physicality is never an end in itself. Well, clearly, when we consider the Sabbath year, that same theme reasserts itself. We're sowing our fields. We are pruning our vineyards. We are so engrossed in coaxing our sustenance from the earth during those other six years. We're liable to think that's all there is. And maybe even the greater danger. We're liable to think we're in control. We're not. The land is mine, says God. Everything physical is subordinated to the spiritual, including all of us. And so there is a Sabbath, not only as a day of the week, but also a Sabbath of the land. Why is it so important for us to have a Sabbath specifically of the land? I'd like to share with you an interesting observation that occurs to me in English. But I suspect that the idea carries over to other languages and certainly other cultures as well. In English, there is a whole vocabulary that we can use to describe our property, our possessions. But when we speak of our homes, our land, we call it real estate, implying that Everything else that's part of our estate is less real than this. There's nothing more solid, more seemingly inviolable than the land and our bond with the land. And therein lies the danger. Because when it's real estate, we're liable to think it really is our estate. And we need God through the sabbatical year and the jubilee year to remind us, the land is mine, says God. Again, that means the land, that means everything is subordinated to absolute truth, absolute goodness, absolute righteousness, absolute justice. The land, everything is God's. And that, of course, is most critical. But there's an additional caveat that it's especially important for us to bear in mind in considering all of this. And that is, you know, the expression that we saw at the beginning of Leviticus chapter 25 was, when you come into the land that I give you. And indeed, all these rules, all these laws apply in one land in the Holy Land, the land of Israel. When you come into the land that I give you, not anywhere else. Why do these rules apply specifically in the land of Israel? Well, I'd like to consider maybe three alternatives that are linked to one another. One is that when we come into the Holy Land, the land of Israel, we're liable to think, this is our final destination. This isn't just a land. This is the Holy Land. So when we take possession of this land, 
this really is ours because after all everything is directed toward this supreme goal remember back at the burning bush in exodus chapter 3 the land was the destination of the exodus so too in exodus chapter 6 i'll bring you forth but not just bring you forth i will bring you to the land that i swore to give to your forefathers so coming into the land we might think we're finished we might think it's really ours and once again we need god to remind us in verse 23 the land is mine that's first aspect first alternative second you know in particular when you consider what it means to be in the holy land what it means to be in god's land it's bad when a subject of a king decides to forget about the king but it's a lot worse when he does it inside the royal palace well the land of israel god says is my royal palace when you're inside the palace you are held to a far higher and more demanding standard than when you're someplace out in the fields in some distant province when you come into the land god says that i am giving you the holy land you better bear in mind the land is mine you better integrate these messages that derive from god being the source of it all elsewhere it's bad if we forget these messages as well but it's much much worse when we do it here and the third aspect that i wanted to share with you which i think is kind of built upon the first two is the realization that god told us to be in the land of israel not for some self-centered agenda that pertains only to the nation of israel ultimately the summons as god expresses it you are my witnesses god directing israel to be light of the nations demands of israel in the land to be particularly sensitive to this message to appreciate the land all the land the earth is god's and by truly integrating that message to be able to project that message to the entire world but it has to start here in the land and as it starts as it develops as we cultivate it through the sabbath and the land we consider just how what the torah teaches us about the sabbatical year develops stage by stage to a deepening realization it's important for us to consider in this regard what god emphasizes later on in leviticus chapter 25 this is verse 38 i am god your lord who brought you forth out of the land of egypt to give you the land of canaan the land of israel to be your god this is all means to an end and we should well consider how this ultimate goal of through the land learning that god is our god is going to happen let's briefly consider the other passages in the torah that provide us with instructions about the sabbatical year the first place that the sabbatical year is mentioned is not in leviticus chapter 25 it is rather in exodus chapter 23. a very brief statement here it's instructive for us to consider how the lessons about the sabbatical year begin and what is crucially further clarified and developed in leviticus chapter 25 because in exodus chapter 23 all we read is 
beginning in verse 10, six years you shall sow your land and gather in the produce thereof. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat. And what they leave, the beast of the field shall eat. In like manner you shall deal with your vineyard and with your olive yard. Now, of course, we'll note the essential principles as we saw them in Leviticus chapter 25 are all here. You are to work the land for six years, and in the seventh year, you don't work it at all, you let it lie fallow. Well, we already discussed this in Leviticus chapter 25, environmental awareness, environmental responsibility. There's also that the poor of your people may eat, social awareness, social responsibility, and even that aspect of concern for the beasts of the field, which maybe brings both of those levels of awareness together. We saw all of these things in Leviticus chapter 25. Well, of course, there's much more detail in Leviticus chapter 25, that's true, but maybe there's an additional deeper level of increased significance in what takes place in Leviticus chapter 25. Note that in Exodus chapter 23, it's that the poor of your people may eat. In Leviticus chapter 25, you're all in the same boat. The land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. Note that expression, you are strangers and sojourners with me, seems awfully reminiscent of what we saw back in verse 6, that the produce of the land will be for your servant and your maidservant, your hired servant, and the sojourner by your side who sojourns with you. Not because you need to give some support to the poor. Of course, that's true. But you need to realize you're the same thing. There's no difference between you and them. You are all tenants of God. The crucial additional message that arises only in Leviticus chapter 25, because, well, maybe in Exodus chapter 23, we weren't yet ready for it, is that one. Again, verse 23, the land is mine. When you truly integrate that, it's not simply a matter of providing to the poor. It's a matter of recognizing we're all the same thing. We all are subordinate to the only source of absolute meaning and absolute value. Because all the humanistic values, likewise, are subordinate to the absolute meaning, absolute value of God. There are two additional passages, both in Deuteronomy, where we also read about the sabbatical year. In Deuteronomy chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, we read, at the end of every seven years, you shall make a release. What does this release mean? And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor shall release that which he has lent unto his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor and his brother because God's release has been proclaimed. In short, forgiving of debts. At the end of the sabbatical year, all debts outstanding are forgiven and no longer need to be paid back. Now, it's important for us to appreciate, on the one hand, this obviously is an extension of the themes and lessons that we already learned in Leviticus chapter 25. That social awareness and social responsibility, and maybe on some plane also, that idea that was so stridently expressed in the case of the Jubilee year, that in the Jubilee year, there is redistribution of wealth, is expressed likewise in the sabbatical year. Debts are forgiven at the end of the sabbatical year. There's an additional dimension that we should appreciate on an operative plane is of phenomenal significance, considering the question that we always need to ask, how do we apply these rules? Remember, Exodus chapter 23 and Leviticus chapter 25 spoke about the land. 
and provided us with rules that apply to the land, only to this land. We have a general principle that the rules that in the Torah are anchored in the land apply specifically to the land. What we read in Deuteronomy chapter 15, of course, has nothing to do with the land. The rule of forgiving debts at the end of the sabbatical year applies throughout the world, not only in the land. That's one additional crucial extension of the lessons that we learned in Exodus chapter 23 and Leviticus chapter 25. But there's another, arguably, even more profound extension, an extension about which we read in Deuteronomy chapter 31. Beginning in verse 10, Moses commanded them, the nation of Israel, saying, at the end of every seven years, in the set time of the year of release, we know which year that is, the sabbatical year, in the Feast of Tabernacles. Again, the year ends and begins in the seventh month for reasons that we've discussed elsewhere. What happens in the Feast of Tabernacles? When all Israel has come to appear before God, your Lord, in the place that he shall choose, you shall read this Torah, this teaching, before all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, the men and the women and the little ones and your stranger that is in within your gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear God your Lord and observe to do all the words of this Torah, of this teaching. And that their children who have not known may hear and learn to fear God your Lord all the days that you live in the land where you pass over the Jordan to possess it. In short, when we consider this extraordinary commandment, it's kind of a recreation in miniature of the giving of God's teaching, the Torah, to Israel at Sinai that takes place not on Mount Sinai, but on the Temple Mount in the precincts of the Holy Temple every seven years at the end of the sabbatical year. Why specifically then? Well, at this point, I think the answer should be clear. If you have taken appropriate advantage of the sabbatical year, then you have learned to whom everything is directed, to what everything is subordinated. You are ready to receive God's word, the Torah, anew. And that's the commandment that is fulfilled on Sukkot just after the sabbatical year ends every seven years. Now, of course, on the one hand, again, we reiterate, certainly Exodus chapter 23 and Leviticus chapter 25 are specifically rooted in the land. Deuteronomy chapter 31, of course, inevitably takes place in the land because the place that God chooses is in the land. But on some place, of course, as dramatically manifest in the forgiving of debts that has nothing to do with the land. These are universal messages. I don't simply mean the humanistic values. I mean the universal messages that are embedded in the realization. The land, says God, is mine. Everything, ultimately, is subordinated to something that goes beyond the physical. And indeed, it doesn't just apply in the land. Well, it's clear, of course, to us that not only the land of Israel belongs to God. As we read in Exodus chapter 19, verse 5, the verses that lead up to God's revelation at Sinai, God says, all the earth is mine. We read likewise in Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is God's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. It's all God's. And we'll also note, apropos of that recurrent theme that we saw in Leviticus chapter 25 about us all 
being sojourners. We only, we only provide for the sojourners. We recognize that we're all strangers and sojourners with God. Well, that theme likewise was expressed by Abraham. Of course, he did express it in the land, but it wasn't wedded specifically to the land. It was a realization that he expresses to the Hittites in Genesis chapter 23, verse four, I am a stranger and sojourner with you. So does King David in Psalm 39, verse 13, Hear my prayer, O God, and give ear unto my cry. Keep not silence at my tears, for I am a stranger with you, O sojourner, as all my fathers were. While King David is also expressing these sentiments in the land, they really have nothing to do with, only with the land. Aren't we all strangers and sojourners with God? After all, wherever we are, whoever we are, in this world, we're just visitors. Our stay is so brief in the grand scheme of everlasting life. We're just guests, strangers, and sojourners. And it's so important for us to realize that. Because if we fail to realize that, we fail to understand the most basic reality that pertains to our lives in this world. The sabbatical year, and in particular, the sabbatical year in the land is all about teaching us these messages. And of course, as a result, while we recognize that these messages are universal, there is special gravity, special responsibility in appreciating these lessons when we are here in this land, when we forget the consequences are disastrous. What happens then? As we read in Leviticus chapter 26, and I'm excerpting, we've discussed Leviticus chapter 26 at greater length elsewhere. When we're in the land, but we don't appreciate what the land is here to teach us. From verse 32, I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies that dwell therein shall be astonished at it. And you will I scatter among the nations, and I will draw out the sword after you. And your land shall be a desolation, and your cities shall be a waste. The land, that precious gift to teach us these lessons, also bears the brunt of the punishment when we fail to learn these lessons. And there's an additional theme in particular that pertains to these lessons. Verse 34, then shall the land be paid her Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate and you are in your enemy's land, even then shall the land rest and repay her Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate, it shall have rest, even the rest which it had not in your Sabbaths when you dwelt upon it. And likewise, we return to the same theme in verse 43, for the land shall lie forsaken without them and shall be paid her Sabbaths while she lies desolate without them and they shall be paid the punishment of their iniquity. The Sabbaths of the land. The lessons that weren't learned the right way need to be learned the hard way. But of course, simultaneously, it is crucial for us to remember the punishments are never intended simply to impose suffering. Punishments are to rehabilitate. Punishments ultimately are then to heal. And so we read 
in verse 42. Then will I remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember. And I will remember the land. Because ultimately, the land is the means for them, for Israel, to learn all of this, to be readied for the role of projecting this light to all of the world. So the punishment is never the end of the story. Verse 44, yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them. Neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them, for I am God their Lord. But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. Ultimately, there's a restoration. And of course, inevitably, we remember here too, that I might be their God. That was, after all, recall in Leviticus chapter 25, in verse 38, what the land of Canaan, the land of Israel, is supposed to teach us. Remember, I am God, your Lord, who brought you forth out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan, to give you the land of Israel, to be your God. Not because God needs to be our sovereign. Remember, we need God to be our sovereign. We need God to be the source of meaning, the source of value, really the source of everything that makes our lives worthwhile. And so then, since that remains the goal, there must be the restoration of the land. God promises. And yet, simultaneously, yes, there is the promise of being restored to the land. But there's also that inescapable realization. We saw it again in verse 23. It's crucial for us to bear it in mind all the time. Whose land is it? The land is mine. We still recognize the sabbatical year, the jubilee year, teach us about environmental responsibility, about social responsibility, even about redistribution of wealth. All laudable humanistic values, but they don't make us into humanists. These humanistic values ultimately can only be actualized through our bond with God through a bond with God that necessarily includes appreciating whose land is this? In Hebrew, my land is Artsi. In all the Bible, there is only one land that God ever describes in that possessive form as Artsi. And I think it is particularly instructive for us to consider just when that possessive form appears. Because there seems to be an interesting pattern that emerges in the Bible, and that is that God goes to great lengths to emphasize Artsi my land, whenever there was someone who was trying conveniently to forget about that reality. Let's begin our brief survey of Artsi, my land, in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 7. The prophet says in God's name, I brought you into the land of fruitful fields to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. And similarly, in Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, my eyes are upon all their ways 
they are not hid from my face, neither is their iniquity concealed from my eyes, and I will recompense their iniquity and their sin double. Because they have profaned my land. They have filled my heritage with the carcasses of their detestable things and their abominations. Again, my land, my heritage. In the interest of full disclosure, of course, I need to admit the embarrassing but inescapable realization that these verses are directed exclusively against Israel. Israel failed. Israel didn't appreciate my land, my heritage. Now, I feel compelled to stress here that there is, I think, a common misunderstanding, a common misunderstanding that in many circles persists to this day. To whom does this land belong? The land of Israel. Does it belong to the nation of Israel, the Jewish people? That's not what God says. God says the land is mine. And it's important for us to remember that our bond to the land is not something that is justified because of the San Remo conference, nor because of the League of Nations mandate to establish a national home for the Jewish people in the land of Israel, nor for that matter, the ratification of that mandate by the United Nations. All well and good but I think we can discern very readily in hindsight how fickle, how flimsy, how fleeting all of those are. The claim that we have to the land of Israel is specifically not because the land of Israel belongs to the people of Israel. The land of Israel belongs to God. God said, this is my land. God said, I want you, Israel, to be in this land. And through your being in this land, I want you to be a light of the nations. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 6, chapter 49, verse 6. That's the role of the land. And it is to fill that role, to fulfill that destiny. I want you to be here. But the land is mine. And indeed, in considering that truth, we can appreciate another passage in Jeremiah. This is Jeremiah telling us in advance about the period of exile that the land will endure because we forgot whose land it was. In Jeremiah chapter 25, in verses 9 and on, we read the dire fate of this land, destruction at the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And in particular, in verses 11 and 12, we read, what the duration of that punishment will be. And this whole land shall be a desolation, a waste and desolation, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will visit upon the king of Babylon and that nation, says God, for their iniquity and the land of Chaldeans, and I will make it perpetual desolations. But that will only be after 70 years, because there will be 70 years of desolation. Why 70? Tantalizingly. Jeremiah never answers that question in the book of Jeremiah. We do get an answer to this question. And ironically, it's an answer in the name of Jeremiah. 
but not in the book of Jeremiah. In nearly the last verses of the book of Chronicles, in the second book of Chronicles, in chapter 36, just before we read of the proclamation of Cyrus that brings the exile to its initial closure, we read in verses 20 and 21, and them that had escaped from the sword, he exiled to Babylon, and they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of God by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had been paid her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she rested to fulfill 70 years. In other words, the 70 years of which the prophet spoke were in direct fulfillment of the warning in Leviticus chapter 26. If you don't keep the Sabbath of the land, the land will get her Sabbaths, but you won't be here. The land will keep her Sabbaths in utter desolation. Well, once again, as we saw in Leviticus chapter 26, there is the punishment and the healing, because the punishment itself is part of the healing. It's all means to rehabilitation. And besides the verses that we saw in Jeremiah chapter 25 that referred to the 70 years, we encounter 70 years one more place in Jeremiah, in chapter 29, beginning in verse 10. Thus says God, after 70 years are accomplished for Babylon, I will remember you and establish, fulfill my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. Once you've learned the lesson, whose land it is, you are ready to come back. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says God, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And you will call upon me and go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and you will seek me and find me, because you shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, says God, and I will return your captivity and gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says God, and I will bring you back unto the place whence I caused you to be exiled. Interesting that the motifs in the prophet's words here in chapter 29 are actually very reminiscent of the Jubilee year in Leviticus chapter 25, returning to our possession. In Leviticus chapter 25, it is, of course, in the ideal way, the right way, when we learn the lesson all along. If we don't, we need to learn the hard way. But eventually we learn. And eventually, God brings us back home. Back home to, not our home, to his home. My land. And um, on that note, I'd like to continue this brief overview of where God speaks of my land in the Bible, driving the point home because there were those who missed the point. In particular, focusing upon four additional places where God says my land because someone forgot. The first in Isaiah chapter 14, beginning in verse 24, the God of hosts has sworn saying, surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand that I will break Assyria in my land and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off them and his burden depart from off their shoulder my land, because Assyria forgot whose land it was. Just consider in Isaiah chapter 36, when 
Sennacherib sends Rab Shaker to taunt the Jews in besieged Jerusalem. Beginning in verse 13, hear you the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Verse 18, have any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? I'm in charge. Verse 20, who are they among all the gods of these lands that have delivered their land out of my hand, that God should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? I'm in charge. Oh, yeah. And in Isaiah chapter 37, we read God's answer through the prophet Isaiah. In verse 22, the virgin daughter of Zion has despised you and left you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head at you. Whom have you taunted and blasphemed? And against whom have you exalted your voice? You have lifted up your eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel. And verse 29, because of your raging against me and for that your uproar has come up into my ears, therefore will I put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips, and I will turn you back by the way by which you come. And the remnant that has escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and out of Mount Zion they that shall escape. The zeal of the God of hosts shall perform this. And as for you, O king of Assyria, in verse 33, he shall not come into the city, nor shoot an arrow there, neither shall he come before it with shield, nor cast a mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and he shall not come unto the city, says God. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake my land not that of Sennacherib and that night camped round about the holy city 185,000 soldiers of the imperial army of Assyria go to sleep and don't wake up verse 36 and the angel of God went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when men arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Because somebody forgot whose land it is. My land. That's number one. Continuing with our second example. This in... Ezekiel chapter 36. Now, before we consider my land in Ezekiel chapter 36, I must note the way the chapter begins is extraordinary and seems at first brush very strange. And you, son of man, prophesy unto the mountains of Israel and say, you mountains of Israel, hear the word of God. Prophesying to mountains? Until you consider Ezekiel is in exile. In Babylon, the delta of the Tigris and Euphrates, a floodplain, not a mountain in sight. And he remembers the land of Israel, the land of mountains and valleys, as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 11. And he prophesies about the mountains. And what is the message? Abridging, because our time is limited. In verse 5, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the nations and against all Edom, that have appointed my land unto themselves for a heritage, with the joy of all their heart, with disdain of soul, to cast it out for a prey. Therefore prophesy concerning the land of Israel, and say unto the mountains and to the hills, to the streams and to the valleys, thus says the Lord God, behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and in my fury, because you have borne the shame of the nations. Surely the nations that are round about you, they shall bear their shame. Because they forgot 
my land. And as for those who learned the message, verse 8, but you, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are near to come. I must share with you, we have an ancient tradition, thousands of years old. There is no more incontrovertible sign of the people of Israel being near to come than when the mountains of Israel shoot forth their branches and yield their fruit bountifully once more. And uh, we've mentioned this in the past, but I feel compelled to mention it once again. When you read the account of the American author, Mark Twain, who came through this land in 1867, mere 149 years ago, and describes a land that is in a state of dismal desolation, a land that has been all but abandoned even by the olive tree and cactus, those fast friends of worthless soil. A land completely devoid of inhabitants. There's no one here. A land empty and for all appearances accursed. And you look at the land of Israel today and you see the mountains of Israel shooting forth their branches and yielding their fruit. And indeed, my people Israel are near to come. When you learn the lesson, you come back home. And even then, there are those who refuse to learn the lesson. And the third place that we encounter, my land, is just two chapters later in Ezekiel chapter 38. When we read about that final battle that takes place here, after the people have begun to return. In verse 14, thus says the Lord God, in that day when my people Israel dwells safely, shall you not know it? And you, Gog, shall come from your place out of the uttermost parts of the north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army, and you will come against my people Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the end of days, and I will bring you against my land, that the nations may know me when I am sanctified through you, that is, through your utter destruction, O Gog, before their eyes. And we read in the continuation in verse 18, it shall come to pass in that day when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury shall arise up in my nostrils. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. Verse 21, and I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. And I will enter into judgment with him with pestilence and with blood. And I will cause to rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many peoples that are with him an overflowing shower and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Why? Because somebody forgot. It's my land, says God. There's one final example. And maybe this is the most important of all. Because so far we saw in Isaiah chapter 14, it was Assyria that forgot my land. In Ezekiel chapter 36, it was Edom forgetting my land. In chapter 38, Gog once again forgot that lesson, my land. In the last chapter of Joel, in some of your Bibles, it may be chapter 3, in mine, chapter 4, depending upon the division of the book into chapters. But what's crucial is what takes place in the first two verses of the chapter. For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring back 
the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. I will gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there. For my people and my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and divided my land. My land. They partitioned. It wasn't their land. It was my land. All the nations, all the nations that forget that lesson, I will bring them down into the valley of Yehoshaphat. Yehoshaphat is Hebrew for God judges. I will judge them there because they forgot. They ignored deliberately that truth. My land. Because, of course, in that vein, it is important for us to remember this is God's palace. When God says, my land, he's always referring to this one. And indeed, it would be the epitome of dishonesty for us, any of us, to fail to appreciate this says something most essential about this land. As we read it in Deuteronomy chapter 11, after verse 11 that talks about the land as being a land of mountains and valleys, we read in verse 12, it's a land that God your Lord cares for. The eyes of God your Lord are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. In a similar vein, in the first book of Kings, after the prayer of dedication of King Solomon for the Holy Temple, we read in first book of Kings, chapter 9, verse 3, that God said to King Solomon, I have heard your prayer and your supplication, and that and that you have made before me, I have hallowed this house which you have built to put my name there forever. And my eyes and my heart shall be there always. Again, in much the same vein, that God's eyes are here. But of course, simultaneously, are God's eyes only here? After all, God isn't a territorial deity. And indeed, in Zechariah chapter 4, immediately after the emphasis upon here, the holy temple, in verse 9, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, his hands shall also finish it. Still, in verse 10, the eyes of God run to and fro through the whole earth. Likewise, in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3, the eyes of God are in every place, keeping watch upon the evil and the good. Of course, it's not just here. It's everywhere. This isn't anything new to us. We already noted. Before God gives Israel the Torah in Exodus chapter 19, verse 5, he says, all the earth is mine. In Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is God's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. It's not just the land. It's not just the land. In some sense, we believe, it is through God's eyes being always upon his land, my land that God's eyes are everywhere. Because there's a problem. There's a problem still. In Exodus chapter 9, you may recall that when Moses tells Pharaoh that he is going to be bringing upon Pharaoh the plague of hell, there's a message that is to be learned from it, that you may know that there is none like me, like God, 
in all the earth. And in particular, after the plague, in verse 29, Moses said unto Pharaoh, as soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread forth my hands unto God. The thunders shall cease, neither shall there be any more hail, that you may know that the earth is God's. Remember the message of God in Exodus chapter 19, verse 5? All the earth is God's. But in verse 30, a realization. But as for you and your servants, I know that you still do not fear God, Lord. Lord. You still haven't learned. My land, this land, is here to teach the world that lesson, to teach the world that message. Ultimately, they're going to learn it. When will they learn it? When we read in the end of days, in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3, many peoples will go and say, go you, and let us go up to the mountain of God, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth Torah, teaching, and the word of God from Jerusalem. That's the message. It needs to be heard. It still needs to be heard. We all still need to learn. I would see my land, this land, ultimately, the whole world is God's. And so, returning to our starting point, we learn all about the importance of taking responsibility for our environment. We learn all about taking responsibility for our society, environmental awareness, social awareness, lofty values, meaningful items to place on the world's agenda. Again, what we could identify reasonably as lofty humanistic values, but the loftiest values come crashing down to nothingness if they aren't anchored in the true source of meaning, in that absolute basis of all value, the source of it all, the source of everything, our creator, God. And so God teaches us about the sabbatical year and the jubilee year. And while the specific commandments may have a particular address and parameters of focus exactly when and where they apply, the message is a message for us all. The message is to realize not just this is God's land, the message is to recognize, as Pharaoh was bidden to recognize all those thousands of years ago, but failed, the whole world is God's. The whole world is God's, and that's what guides us to appreciating the gifts that God gives us and our responsibility to those gifts to the world around us, the environment, to those less fortunate than we are, even to the beasts of the field. Because in some sense, the greatest gift is that God gives us the responsibility to get to work, to get to work in reconnecting all of this, everything, with its source, the only source in God. And then, of course, inevitably, while this land, my land, is the land where God says his eyes are always, from this land, 
once we learn this message. The blessings go out to the entire world. We all learn the lessons. We all appreciate not just that this land is God's land, but that all the earth is God's. The greatest blessing to be connected to the source. God bless you.